Awesome. So, Gail and Craig, we have our uh, end of year report for the natural environment and water quality targeted rates. And this is um, this is an information report, but it's very exciting and it's important that we bring it to committee this way to uh, celebrate and promote all the great work that's being done out there. So I hope councillors have um, looked through the, the item on the agenda really well and we'll have, um, I think, is it Gail up first? Thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou koutou. Uh, and thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, as Richard said, this is pretty exciting from our perspective. Uh, uh, Craig and I are here to talk to you today about some of the amazing work that has been done over the FY 2019-2020 year. Uh, I just want to really quickly um, acknowledge that the work that you're reading about in the report, and we'll hear very briefly about now in terms of overview, is being carried out by hundreds of staff and really want to particularly acknowledge um, Mara Bebich in the back and her team, including Merrily, who just, you know, go do the hard mahi and putting these pictures together for us. And, you know, I think I'm probably biased, but I think you'll agree that it's a pretty stunning piece of collateral, that um, annual report. So it's great to see. Uh, and, and that... Um, I think brings up to one of the key f features of the natural environment targeted rate. It is a cross council co-delivered program of work. So environmental services um, does the bulk of delivery, but we're really well supported by particularly parks and community facilities and also REMU. So it is an example of cross council collaboration. the five key programs. So the Natural Environment Target Rate, as you all know, 10-year program of work, um, created a fourfold increase in council's investment in the natural environment over that 10-year period, um, broken up into five key programs. There's about 40 to 50 projects across those five key programs. Uh, the Kauri Dibat one, there's a slide on that later, so I'll just leave that for now. Um, the Restore Ecological um, Health and the large-scale work we're doing now on um, getting on top of pest animals and pest plants. And that's uh, across all 10 years. Um, and it's particularly growing to be more and more landscape scale type work. So it's work that's not only on our own asset, which is our local and regional parks, but also on private land, supporting rural landowners to do their bit about um, some of the particularly high ecological value sites in Auckland directly on private land rather than public land. So that work's quite important. Supporting community-led conservation action. Um, you heard an amazing presentation this morning from, from Janet about the potential future for community-led conservation and that great, what I'd call, direction of travel, which is more building environment and social outcomes together. Because at the end of the day, this is not environment for environment's sake. This is what it is. But it's also environment as it contributes to the future of Auckland and we get the social outcomes and, and some of the economic wellbeing results as well. So great to hear that. And we're continuing to um, support the community-led conservation part of that picture. Um, a, a significant upturn in work, um, what we call our marine program, but our marine program is actually multifaceted. So the marine program is all the work we do on the island eradications, and I'll say a couple more things about that in a minute, um, but it's also all the work we do with our biosecurity dogs, for example, preventing re-incursions of pests to those islands. It's the work below the waterline, so it's the marine biosecurity work, things like the Mediterranean fanworm, um, and, and trying to keep on top of that, working quite closely with the commercial and residential, or recreational, I should say, boaties. Uh, and then it's also work with some of the shorebird and seabird habitats and protecting their breeding. Um, and then the fifth and final um, program is uh, our digital platforms, and I'll just as well, if I could have the next, am I meant to be controlling this? I should know by now. <laughs> oh, I can't, okay, thank you, Saad. Uh, yeah, COVID didn't have too much of an impact on us and you will see that in the, in the report. Uh, we certainly stopped everything alert level four um, with the exception of some um, biosecurity incursion response. 
You might have seen the coverage in the news over that time. We thought it went viral. Uh, you know, that footage of the guy at 2 a.m. in the morning when we were out there with our cameras trying to find a stoat in Motokuria Island, Browns Island, and 2 a.m. in the morning um, we captured, we didn't capture the stoat, but we did capture a guy out on his own doing whatever he was doing out there. So that went sort of viral. Uh, so we did continue with that work over the, um, over the level 14. Um, but time we got to level three, we got approval to go ahead with the bulk of our pest control work on the basis that, and, and you all know this is a feature of pest control, you don't want to stop um, because you lose the benefit of previous investments. So we kept going with the pest control work and we re-established the Kauri dieback track upgrade work as well. Uh, in terms of the emergency budget, um, we uh, did defer um, some programs, but again, I think with the targeted rate, we were quite fortunate, um, particularly with the Kauri dieback program, we deferred about five million of the initially planned 11 million spend for Kauri dieback, so about half of the spend, but we're on good track for that track upgrade part of our Kauri dieback program, so you'll see in a minute that um, we're very confident that um, we can just shunt some of that forward and still continue to deliver all the proposed track upgrades within the five-year work program. Uh, segue to Kauri dieback. So, uh, this is just a case study on uh, some of the track upgrade and you're going to get a full report in a couple of months on the whole Kauri Dibat program because the track upgrades is what we talk about most but it's actually quite a comprehensive program, it includes all our surveillance work, includes a lot of awareness raising, something like 91% of Aucklanders that were asked in a, in a survey done quite recently um, were aware of Kauri Dibat so there's awareness raising, there's the um, research we do on things like phosphite injections and there's support for private landowners that have Kauri as well. Um, but that just showcases that particular picture, um, some work we've done on um, the Hillary track. Based on the, uh, the tracks, focusing on the tracks for a second, 33 tracks um, over the year. Um, in terms of kilometres, 47 kilometres of tracks in regional parks and 11 kilometres of tracks in local parks. So um, at the end of that first year, we're basically about halfway through that five-year program. So as I said, we've got time to catch up, even though we've had to cut back a bit for this year. Uh, enabling tools, uh, the case study there, um, I'm hoping that some of you will have had a chance to look at this. We did quite a big launch of this in Conservation Week. This is our sort of flagship Te Aki Tamaki Makaurau website. If you haven't had a look, really encourage you, um, the, the website um, is up there. It's basically the one-stop shop for conservation activity in Auckland. So it's got, I see it as an amplifier, so it's essentially connecting council Department of Conservation, Land Care, Philanthropics, all the big entities, plus the smaller groups together. It's got something like 500 links um, to different community groups, so community groups can see what each other's doing. Because, and I've spoken about this before in this forum, we've got about 1,700 community groups doing small pieces of the puzzle, but this site gives us the opportunity to showcase the, the region-wide change, things like changes in um, observations of bellbirds and backyards, that sort of thing will be on maps in this conservation portal, so it's a really cool tool. Uh, next, please. Uh, and then the islands, I spoke briefly at the breadth of the marine program, and the case study here is the Takoro o Waiheke, which um, is the large-scale predator-free eradication in Waiheke. Now, if, um, the stoke is progressing quite well. We've got 1,500 traps out there. Um, we deferred as part of the emergency budget moving on to the rats for this year, but that actually works quite well because we're still working out the methods for eliminating rats. If we can um, pull this off, it's... it's a world first in terms of that scale of eradication in an urban and rural setting. Uh, so it's got a huge amount of um, uh, community support. And the other um, feature of that program, which runs across many of our programs, is good leverage. So council contributes, but we also get leverage from central government and things like Predator Free New Zealand in this case. And I see in the future that's going to grow with things like Jobs for Nature. So whatever we invest on ratepayers' behalf is being expanded by other contributions. 
And that's a very quick, rapidly um, spoken uh, tour, but it's all in here and um, yeah, it, it's, it's a privilege to, to bring this to you and um, yeah, thank you. It's perfect, thank you, Gail. And we're just on to Craig. Malo Elele and Kia ora, everyone. Delighted to present the Water Quality Targeted Rate Progress Report for the year. As you know, it's all about how we reduce public health risks from overflows and improving the ecology of our waterways. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to briefly remind you around of the five work programs. We have the Western Isthmus Water Quality Improvement Program, the Safe Networks Program, the Stormwater Contaminant Reduction Program, the Urban and Stream Rehabilitation Program, and the On-Site Wastewater System Compliance Program. Like Gales area, we weren't dramatically impacted by COVID because of the nature of our works, but what we did end up doing as part of the emergency budget was having a couple of minor deferrals. So the Waterview Network separation works were deferred, and our on-site wastewater database it was deferred from this financial year that we're in at the moment and that, that work will then be moved into uh, subsequent years. Just like to initially focus on the Western Isthmus program because obviously this is the big program within the water quality targeted rate, around about 70 to 80 per cent of the targeted rate it sits under the Western Isthmus banner. I'd like to initially start by talking about the uh, Akahu Bay project. Now you might say, well, Akahu Bay is not in the Western Isthmus, but the reality is the work in Akahu Bay um, and provides for increased capacity in the Araki main sewer, which reduces overflows in the Western Isthmus. So it is indirectly linked to the Western Isthmus. And we obviously have a very significant separation program underway there, which is on target for completion by June 2021. The Daldy Street project is uh, delivered through the Wynyard Edge Alliance and I'm delighted to say that that program is now effectively, the physical works are complete and we're just going through the final contract wash up for that particular job. The work in Freemans Bay, which specifically at this stage is in relation to separation works in Picton Street, that work is about 50% complete and on target for completion in April 21. And the St Mary's Bay uh, project is also about 50% complete and on target, that's by money as opposed to by time, and is on target for completion now in September 2021. And just an interesting bit of uh, background on the project, the outfall that goes from Macefield Beach out to near the Harbour Bridge is some um, 400 metres long, and that's actually been made in... Thames at the moment by uh, welding together uh, lengths of plastic pipe and that's going to be towed up by a barge, a, six, a 400 metre long sausage will be towed up from Thames and be dropped into the harbour, um, next to the harbour bridge, dropped into a channel that will have been constructed ahead of time and that work is scheduled to take place in late October so it'll be quite an interesting uh, task to observe. Uh, next slide please. So we've talked quite a bit about the need to actually get into the forensic work to really understand what's happening in our networks and I'm pretty proud of the amount of work that's been achieved in this area. This really is the MRI of wastewater and stormwater. It's not until you get into that level of forensic detail that you can understand what's happening in the catchments. So we've had some 108 uh, stormwater outlets sampled now at 16 beaches and 15 k's of the network have been put under this detailed network inspection. And Langhome is a great example where we actually identified a previously unknown issue with the wastewater network, which I have to say and acknowledge the great support we've had from Watercare. So Watercare got in and fixed that problem and that, is, that beach will move from a permanent red to a beach that is now predominantly green and that's because until you go in and actually analyse and look at these issues and, and you find them, things can go on for years and years and years without people being aware of it. So the, the fact that the funding is now there to do this detailed assessment is going to make a huge difference over time to the success of the programme. 
Uh, next slide, please. And another great example is the work we're doing in the contaminant reduction space. So the, um, the Tira Paruri uh, wetland in the, uh, in the regional park, that's been another major success story where this is where we had a 13 hectare wetland which hadn't been previously fenced off, so stock were getting into the area, causing a lot of stream erosion work. As you can imagine, stock and streams doesn't really go together that well. So we did a major fencing and replanting program, and that's just a, a small exemplar of the sort of thing that's going to have to happen across the region. And obviously the Kuiper projects now had a great boost with the announcement by central government of the funding to support the, that particular initiative. And we'd like to see programs of this extended not only to the Kuipra, but all of the harbours in the, in the region. And, and obviously Gail and I are both delighted to um, take any questions. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Casey. Craig, can you remind me if the Western Isthmus uh, reference group or whatever it was called is still meeting? Is that, I don't think I've been at a meeting for several years. So what's happening on the Western Isthmus is that Watercare had an existing um, uh, community group they were working with in relation to the Central Interceptor. We've brought all of our work together with Watercare's work. So I, I have to apologise if you've been left off the list, uh, Cathy, because they've been very active over recent times. But now that I'm aware of it, I'll make sure that you get added to the list. Councillor Coombe. Deputy. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Tēnā kurua. Thank you for coming along and presenting it. It's really awesome to see this report and just the value of the targeted rate and there's some so many good news stories there. Um, I just have a, a query, Craig, in terms of, I guess this is a, an ongoing concern about our the fact that we have not been undertaking our regional responsibilities. And the example you gave of Langholm, and I mean, it's a fantastic outcome there, but does this suggest that for many, many years prior to the targeted rate, we were not actually undertaking our obligations as a, as a unified council in terms of managing the effects of land use and, you know, all of the hazards and... and Pollution and is this still a gap that we should be concerned about as a council? I think the issue to me is, in this case, more than a land use issue. It's the fact that when you have pipe networks in the ground, that they are effectively live things, and until you continually monitor and assess the condition of that network, you don't actually know what's going on. It might all appear. Um, fine on the surface, but, but pipes over time will crack through a number of different reasons. And it's really those cracked pipes that causes the problem. And it's really the cracking that causes the problem because the wastewater will naturally move to... So the stormwater network is effectively the way that water naturally gets to the coast. So when you have a fracture in a wastewater pipe, it will actually tend to track through the stormwater system. And so the real key is spending enough money on your wastewater network investigation to understand the, quant the quality and the quantity of the pipe work so the effective remediation work can be done at the right time. The problem with this is expensive work and it does require a significant investment. And it's now that we've got the targeted rate, that creates the opportunity by working in partnership with Watercare to start to prioritise and, and do that work. I just think previously there wasn't the funding available to, to do that work. So can I just to clarify then, so you, you feel confident that we are now undertaking our responsibilities? Look, you can always argue there's the need to do more. And in an ideal world, we would probably have a little bit more to do, uh, run a larger programme. But in the current circumstances, I think we've, we're doing pretty darn well in terms of our understanding of our network. I think if you take uh, New Zealand Inc, the level of understanding of the network operation in Auckland would be far superior to anywhere else in New Zealand. And so we're putting a major effort into this task, 
but it is a really, really difficult task. It's a bit like fighting rust. You will never win, but you just have to keep chipping away and chipping away because pipe networks degrade over time, and you can expect a pipe one year and you come back five years later and, and it's, it's got an issue. And so you just have to, it's an ongoing battle, but it's one that we just have to tackle. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Got a question for um, Craig. Um, I'm looking at the uh, page, it's on page 46 of our agenda that covers off the on site wastewater compliance program. And the good news is that uh, we're really building a a database so we know um, where the on-site systems are and obviously that includes septic tanks and yes we're moving on um, compliance. Um, having having said that I was at a meeting with Councillor Watson with members uh, with somebody from the Whanuapai uh, Ratepayers Association or organisation just the other day where there's a significant problem with uh, sewage from septic tanks leaking into the stormwater system and creating, frankly, a significant health problem in the area. Um, so I understand it's it's good to have a, a database and the like, but what sort of resource have we got going forward solving those problems in small communities where we need to get on to the installation of biofilters, conceivably separating out grey water, applying water conservation techniques, making sure the stormwater is appropriately managed away from the septic fields and so on. So how are we getting on in terms of implementation on the ground? So we've made a, uh, a start on that program, Councillor Walker, but you, you'd have to understand that this is a big issue for Auckland. We've got so many uh, people that are on local uh, wastewater treatment systems that we, we're still at a stage now where we're trying to get our handle around the exact size of the issue that we're, we're dealing with, and then we'll be able to prioritise and, and, and make the appropriate um, decisions. So this really needs to be a situation too where council can provide the, um, the evidence, but then the, the local resident through, if, if at all else fails, we're gonna have to go through a, a form of a regulatory process in order to get the work done. But ideally, there'll be a willing buyer, willing seller situation where we can jointly challenge these issues. Hey, I think I'm bringing to your attention that across a number of communities, Murawai, Whanuapai, other communities where you've got more, more intensification occurring, there are more people living there, we've got significant sewage overflow um, issues that really require an immediate response. I mean... We've, we've known about some of these circumstances now for decades and we just don't seem to uh, resolve them. I do note, however, that we've had some good approaches in Waiheke, for example, where the local board's been actively involved. So we welcome working with local communities and with the local boards. That where we've got known problem areas, we're very happy to come in and, and support and, and look at what a, a sensible outcome may look like. I think something that council is going to have to confront over time is that at what stage do you move from local solutions to perhaps a small network and a, and a local treatment plant or the like? That may end up at, at some stage as being the most cost effective solution for a community. And that's something that I think in the future we're going to have to have to tackle as a, as a potential option and a way forward in these areas. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Uh, member, oh, sorry, Councillor Darby. Yeah, can we just go back to the last slide, or the penultimate slide, actually? Is that the is that the beach that Councillor Coombe is referring to? Is um, is that up there? Just while it's coming up, is that a healthy water slide? Is it? Yes. Yeah, so that's the uh, that's the uh, that's the coastline of the regional park on the on the Kaipara Harbour. So it's interesting, when I saw that slide, I didn't look at the shell in the water. I looked at the invasive pest plants, the pampas. And I was just wondering whether Carol, um, uh, sorry, Gail, um, it's like it's about the parts of the council thinking together. 
and I, I looked at that slide and I thought this was about showing water quality, except that division doesn't do Pampas. And I was just sort of emphasising this about the joined up approach, really. Maybe I'm overcooking it, but Gail, what did you notice in that slide? Actually, I noticed the landforms, but, you know, in the... I guess the composition of the photograph, actually. But to your point, um, look, that's not overcooking it, Councillor Darby. That is spot on. And what I've seen, particularly over the last couple of years, is healthy waters and environmental services working more and more closely together. I mean, the best current example is the farm environment plans. I mean, picking up, Pippa, on, on, on your point around, um, you know, what are we doing about rural land water management in our... A mandate as a regional as opposed to district council responsibilities. Huge amount of work happening in that space across the country. Craig's, Craig's aware of this. And where it's leading to, under the National Policy Statement stuff, is farm environment plans. Now, the farm environment plans, we've been working with local farm owners for decades on ecological restoration. It doesn't make any sense for someone to come in and talk to them about water quality and someone else to talk to them about ecological. So we're working together on that. And obviously, um, that drive is coming from Mana Whenua as well, because it, the, the topics are so integrated. So, so we've got a way to go, but we're absolutely heading in that direction. Mm, thank you. So just going, we've got over 10 years, there's about three quarters of a billion dollars from the generosity of Aucklanders. Um, and I was just wondering, going forward, how are we going to read success? We've got, we're, we're seeing um, delivery of projects and programs here today, but can I assume that there is a, some baseline data, like before we embarked on this delivery, we have baseline data, and as we, as we move through uh, and we implement projects and programs, we can reconcile the new data against the baseline data and measure our success, whether it be for pest control, big dollop of money going into water quality. Is that my assumption? And then eventually, maybe four or five years out, we can look at baseline uh, data over the years of delivery and reconcile that with the business case, which was used to source the money in the first place. Is, is that the expectation? So on the Western Isthmus program, which is the big chunk of the water quality targeted rate for the first 10 years, I can give you a categoric assurance that we reported to the committee, I think it was in October 2017, with what success looked like for that project. And we said success will be achieved. We've got 10 overflow points, which will have a frequency of between 2 and 6. Every other overflow point will have a frequency of 2 or less. We identified where those 10 sites were. And quite frankly, that's given us absolutely nowhere to hide. And if we can achieve that outcome, we will have delivered on our beach availability target. So I think for that program in particular, we were quite detailed and specific about what success looks like. Some of the other programs, by their very nature, are harder to get your arms around. Safe networks is an ongoing issue. I don't quite know what a KPI for safe networks would look like other than doing so many kilometres of testing a year because until we do the testing we don't know what the, what the fix necessarily looks like. But I think as much as possible, I totally agree with you, we need to have a, a measure of what success looks like and I think for the majority of the water programmes we can say that hand on heart, what success looks like. So the majority, so what, what are we missing? What do we... What do we need to put in place? Because there's a I'm, look, I'm just saying there's a lot of money at stake here, and a community has high expectation because uh, they've they're coming forward with this targeted rate money for delivery of outcomes. Um, so if we take urban and rural stream rehabilitation, there'll never be enough money to do full rehabilitation of all of the urban and rural streams. So we're going to have to make a call as to which streams and how we prioritise those streams. So that's an example, I guess. We, this program, I mean, I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it again, I believe this program isn't going to end in 10 years. We'll be having a conversation in the next LTP 
over what happens, because this program at the moment and the LTP stops in year 2028, the next LTP takes us out to 2031. But in terms of the program and, and how far we go, I think in the water sense, at least, I can see this as needing to be an ongoing program in order to get out, get ahead of the game. Yeah, no, no doubt. I don't question that. I'm just questioning the measures, and I'm just I'll, I'll be looking out in you know months and years ahead to to reconcile what was and what is, and what was spent and what programs were implemented, and did we get the benefits that we assumed? That's yeah. what I'm referring I to. I am totally committed to the concept of having finite and, and discrete KPIs where we are, I'm very happy to be held to account for the outcomes and, 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 and giving the community the satisfaction that they are getting value for money with, the, as you say, the significant monies that are going into the program. Just to supplement that from an ecological perspective, prior to the targeted rate being approved, it's completely patchy. Like, Council, in the first X years since amalgamation, didn't invest in ecological data management in any way. So the ecological data was sort of hidden in PDFs associated with resource consents and people's old folders. And once we got the targeted rate, that fifth program that I talked about, the enabling tools, that was specifically to turn that situation around. So we've been scrambling a bit, but we now have a quite well-established baseline of data. We've got a program I didn't have time to mention called Ruru, which is our spatial database, and that's giving us the baseline so that we can layer on that the change associated with the targeted rates. So we're, we're going to get there because, like Craig, you know, we've got to be able to demonstrate tangibly what Aucklanders have bought and what the results are. So we're working on that, but we had a late start. We, was, we didn't actually start getting that together until we had the funding available through the targeted rate. Look, Chair, just in rounding up, my line of questioning is, is not doubting the need for the investment at all. I mean, you, you know that. It's just about ensuring the measures are in place, report, measure, report, mm. uh, so that we can actually build the business case for the next LTP and the next LTP, because we're going to have to keep growing the investment in this area. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Darby. Um, member Glenn Wilcox. We're just unmuting you, Glenn. Sorry. Hello, am I there? You got me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yep, hear okay. Um, yeah, my question relates to the targeted rate for the environment and mainly around Cowley dieback, and I suppose it's topical because um, you know it only just came through that that man that was walking and, and uh, walking on tracks that were closed. So I suppose my question is: Do we need to do we need to spend money on compliance or education as opposed to actually trying to close tracks or whatnot? Because it only takes one person to spread the vector of of pathogens. So I'm I'm just kind of get a handle on on this calorie dieback co-popper if we've got people who just are refusing to to follow the rules uh, yeah thank you Kari dieback you're absolutely right we need to focus on compliance and awareness raising I mentioned that we've been quite encouraged that the results we're getting for Aucklanders awareness of curry dieback is about 90%. So that message has got through reasonably loud and clearly. Um, the compliance um, approach, so Environmental Services works with our regulatory team who are experts in compliance and they take a, a sort of a blitz, blitz approach. So a key public holidays like Easter, for example, or Labor weekends, they um, you know, put in place 15 or so staff at all the um, most popular locations. We've also got ambassadors. Last summer, we had a total of 36 ambassadors. Um, half of them were curry dieback, the other half were Marines 
surveillance people, but they're out in the tracks um, educating people and checking people are complying and checking that people aren't accessing closed tracks. Having said all that, there's always the outliers, right? There's always um, people that will ignore um, the signage and not comply. A bit worryingly, actually, when we looked closely at that data, it became clear that the uh, dominant um, proportion of those people were actually local people um, rather than people coming in from outside Auckland or visitors. But, we're, but we are keeping, um, keeping a watch on that, doing the compliance work and monitoring um, who, you know, what the numbers in terms of people not complying. And then the other parts of that, of course, um, on the Curry Dieback program are um, to give you a, a broader feel of the entire Kopapa, uh, the research work we're doing, the applied research, and also regular monitoring. Interestingly, actually, next year we go around every five years and rotate around the regional parks for monitoring. And next year is we're scheduled to go back to Waitakere and check um, infection levels five years on from the last time we did it, which. Um, that prompted the original closure. So I, I think my question to you kind of relates to this is that if we're doing all this, if we're spending all this money towards Kauri Dieback and Waitakere and we have locals who are refusing, and, and it's, I know it's only a small number, but it only takes a couple, but if we have locals who are refusing to, to follow the rules, why are we bothering? Um, because they are the ones that are spreading it again, and and I suppose I just want to, you know, it was it was all because of Waitakere that we did this. Waitakere local board led this kopapa, along with others, but really led this kopapa about closing these tracks. But it seems like the locals actually don't care anymore, or there's a percentage that don't care, and so it concerns me that we're spending this money on, on trying to protect Waitakere when there's a small percentage of people who just don't care. Yeah, I, I get that point, but I think it would be a shame to risk the taonga, which is our kauri, because of um, a few outliers. You know, we, we just need to make sure we do what we can to keep those outlier numbers as low as possible. Um, and just on the, the program, though, uh, uh, Glenn, the, it was originally Waitakere. We've now got 47 kilometres over the regional parks and another 11 kilometres over local parks. So it's it's much more region wide now. But you know you make a very good point, and we'll keep working with the compliance experts to keep that non-compliance as low as possible. Thank you, Chair. Kia ora. Thank you, Member Wilcox. Um, now we'll go on to comments. Um, Councillor Mulholland. Uh, so I'll just, uh, sorry, I'll move in second. Uh, I can't do both of those things. I'll move. <laughs> Councillor Mulholland, if you'd like to second, and then you could speak to the targeted rates. Kia yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to comment. Mine, of course, is not a question, as noted. Um, Gail, Craig, and your teams, including all of the many volunteers, um, I particularly in the area of the FOE and of course um, my involvement last term and um, moving forward want to acknowledge and thank you for all the really outstanding work that has been undertaken. And it's clear to me that this is an appropriate targeted rate for our community and I can stand strong and share that with the people of Tamaki Makoto that the output um, is um, evidenced and it's great to always hear from you Craig because I have um, utmost faith in yourself and the team um, and I am well aware of those KPIs and I do see it working in the community here. Um, I agree that the presentation um, that has been provided and the images, it really does share um, with us the um, significant amount of work that is going into us and I do hope and would like to support you in any way possible that we share that um, and uh, Mr Chair I think it's critical we do um, share this with our communities as locally ele um, elected representatives. Um, whilst it may not be pretty and we all know I'm a country girl at heart having come from 
um, Hamilton, the Waikato, um, I'm really happy to support the rat eradication. I, I also believe in my mind that it is no surprise to not only myself but others that we can be world leading in Aotearoa. Um, and of course, for um, that project, um, if there's anything that uh, myself um, or people I'm familiar with and community can support on, I'm absolutely happy to do that because rats don't frighten me. Um, so great to see the project's also moved from 10 to 5 for the natural environment. Um, I just really felt it important to uh, say how important it was for me to share from my perspective and the feedback that I've had in the community, the great work that has um, been undertaken and that's a fabulous report. So kia ora chia and thank you to the team. Thank you, Councillor Mulholland. Uh, Councillor Henderson, you have a comment as well. Oh, we can't hear you yet, Councillor Henderson. Is Shane blocked? Um, not blocked, are you? Is Shane muted? We would never block you, Shane. I'm not sure why we can't hear you, but we'll go to Councillor Simpson and then back to you, Councillor Henderson. Well, thanks, Mr Chair. Look, I just want to make a quick comment. I think it's really important that when we have um, a targeted rate that is an extra rate for the people of Auckland, that we report back on that. And I just want to congratulate those who put the report together. Um, and I actually share Councillor Mulholland's view too. I mean... Everybody in Auckland has contributed to this success and we need to promote it greatly. So um, I just want to say congratulations and yes, let's get that message out. They've done a great job putting this report together. It's something that we should be proud of. Sadly, the starting point was very, very, very poor, but it was important enough for the people of Auckland to accept those extra rates. And I think it's important for Auckland to, to have the messaging of, of how that have been spent. Thank you. Kia thank you, Councillor Simpson. And we'll try Councillor Henderson again. Hopefully we can hear him. Damn it, have you, try, have you tried leaving the conversation and coming back, Councillor Henderson? Sorry, we seem to have lost you. It's a sh he says, I give up, which is sad. <laughs> I'm sure he would have some fantastic things to say. <laughs> um, okay, Councillor Cooper will have a comment and maybe, oh, yes. Okay, Councillor Cooper. Maybe Councillor Henderson can te text me some stuff, but um, I think probably maybe similar comments because out west it's affected our especially our locals greatly and, and just noting um, Member Wilcox talking about people breaching and it is locals because you know what we've done is really significant because we have to protect Kauris but it, it has really it has really affected the local people because that's their you know their well-being and physical and mental so you know we have to really acknowledge that but I also want to acknowledge all the work um, that's been done with this environmental targeted rate on the track reopening. You know, we, it's it's outstanding work. Was it 47 kilometres? You know, and that's make, made a real difference for locals that we, they can go back in there with confidence that they're not, um, you know, spreading spreading Kauri Dai back, but actually still be able to enjoy the park. And I think for people all over the region, but it, it is it is really difficult. Um, it, it has been a difficult time, but it'll be really good to see. I'm really looking forward. Um, Gail to that next report to see if we've made any headway at all um, but also the water quality and talking about Langholm, um, Huia, places like that where um, people would like to use the beaches and they haven't been able to and now they can and that real collaborative working with our CCOs and the different departments of the council have made a huge difference and I think we did make a really, we made the right decision having an environmental targeted rate and to acknowledge the Mayor for that, um, putting that forward, and our water quality targeted rate. People know what they're getting for their rates, and now we can see results. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. And I will read out uh, Councillor Henderson's comment. Thank you on behalf of the Langholm community for the beach work 
and noting as well the great work done at Weymouth Beach in Manurewa too. Difficult time for locals. The breaches are, are locals because the forest is in their blood, as West Aucklanders. I'm not condoning it, far from it. They are risking the environment of the bush that is the birthright of every Westie. But we aren't dealing with yobs. <laughs> they are passionate people and we just need to understand that. Uh, thanks for reaching out, Chair. You're a legend. Oh, I <laughs> probably didn't need to read that. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Linda Cooper agrees. Um, <laughs> well, they think the first part. Um, kia ora, Shane, and sorry you couldn't connect. <laughs> sorry you couldn't connect. It's always good to hear from you. Um, we, uh, I'll just have a few comments, and then we're going to uh, go to Barry for some last comments, and then we'll go to lunch. But um, the comments I have just for both of you, thank you so much. I think we couldn't have expected, I mean, we did it hope, but we couldn't have expected the amount of work that has been done out there by um, by our, our staff and by our contractors, by yourselves and your teams, but also the community who've really come on board. Some of the, the amazing uh, community groups that have been able to grow and really strengthen and feel supported by council. Obviously not everything is perfect yet, but you know the significant amount of work I know in Kaipataki with the, um, the Cody Dibat, the tracks, you know, during level three lockdown, seeing the helicopters, you know, helicopter in parts of the tracks and, and it's just phenomenal amounts of work going on. Um, and the the, trident, the stations um, for people to get through and protect our bush, um, and so we didn't have to lock them off for for decades. The pest work, the the water quality space, Craig, you know that what's been done in Takapuna, and the things that have been um, seen from the safe networks, and then gone on for infrastructure um, investment after that. And it, it will take time, but it is speeding up faster than a. Um, anything I've seen before. And I think we know, with the support of those targeted rates from the community, that people are really supportive. And now it's fantastic to see people are, are interested in water quality, environment, climate change. I know there have been people who've been talking about this for decades, but it's great to see those people have now convinced their communities this is important, and so are we. So on that, uh, I thank you, and we will, um, we will move uh, this. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. No. Cool. Thank you. And just before we leave, we just need to acknowledge um, Gail, who's unfortunately is leaving us after so much uh, great work, and this will be obviously her last um, committee presenting to us. I'll, I'll flick over to um, Barry Potter first, who will say a few things, and then he'll come back to me. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Mr Chair. And, and um, uh, this is Gail's last session, and, and tomorrow's her last day, so it's a, a very sad time uh, for us. And I just want to um, perhaps share a little bit of Gail's background and some of the successes that she's had over that period, and I know others will want to comment as well. So uh, Gail, uh, I think, uh, well, it's been a, quite a long time, a whole career in the environmental area, uh, and not just in New Zealand, because she came here to council, I think, from Hong Kong, Gail, uh, where she'd uh, been based and working in the Middle East for a number of years uh, with uh, one of the uh, private sector big uh, global uh, consultancies. And Gail joined here in um, April 2012 as the biodiversity manager and then was appointed to general manager of environmental services at the end of 2012 in December. Uh, look, um, uh, during that time here, substantial contributions to not just Auckland, but to, uh, to nationally. And some of those I just want to um, highlight. And these, of course, have come out in the discussion we've just had. Um, the, the establishment of the Natural Environment Targeted Rate was a great success. And I recall at the time, you know, um, this may, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but others heard me say this before, there's usually three recommendations. There's the status quo, there's the one that's the big global thing you're never going to get, and then there's one you go for in the middle. Maybe that's a bit simplistic. And that's what we put up here, and I thought we'd go for the middle one. With Gail's work, uh, you'll recall that we actually got the uh, top um, recommendation there. So a huge success. And I think we are, well, I know we're seeing uh, the changes in the environment uh, through, through that, Gail, and what you've done there. Um, but it's not just that. There's been the uh, development of the new regional pest management plan. And that was quite an exercise and brought in a number of new, uh, new things. And some of us will recall some of the discussions around um, 
uh, some animals at the time, um, but uh, that has been a big step forward. We've talked about um, the Kauri dieback program and the amount of work that's gone on there and the way that's actually just changed, uh, I, as people will know, I'm a Westie, the tracks out there, they're now fit for purpose for what they should have been all along uh, and, uh, and they're, they're being opened up, Kauri being opened up out there. We've had the uh, Pest Free Auckland program, uh, and that's quite remarkable. Over you know 1,700 groups out there, community groups, uh, dealing with pests in their neighbourhoods. Wonderful achievement, and, uh, and and quite quite something. We've had the um, the schools program, and the number of young people who are now driving the environmental program, and uh, and opportunities through that schools program, where they see what can be done. I, I recall. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. The, we had the discussion about the Hanua Ranges and the and the uh, 1080 drop in the Hanua Ranges. Look, the outcome of that program has been that we've gone from uh, 25 pairs of breeding kokako in the Hanua Ranges through to over 100 now. Quite something. And uh, and you can go down there and you can actually hear, hear the kokako uh, at the right time of the year. We've had the uh, low carbon living programs and the impact that that's had on, on households and businesses in different ways of looking at things. Um, and um, we've had a lot of input uh, that Gail's led into the, um, the, the weed management program and the impact that that's had. Outside of council, uh, she's been very involved in many other things and held um, positions as an elected member of the Sustainable Business Network and Enviro Schools Boards. Uh, and the uh, Resource Management Law Association National Committee, very involved nationally in programs there. So there's things we can talk about, uh, her leadership and the, um, and the, uh, the positive way she interacts and, and uh, the, the, the excitement that always goes around Gail. We can talk about those. For me, um, probably the strongest uh, message that I see and the thing that I observe is her absolute commitment and passion to taking us ahead in the environment. So, Gail, uh, we're sad to see you go. You're on to some other things, but thank you very much uh, for what you've done in your eight and a half years here. Thank you, Kia ora. Thank you Barry. Um, I just have a message from a previous councillor and Deputy Mayor, uh, Penny Hulse. So, tēnā koe, Gail. I hope your last Environment and Climate Change Committee is going well. This must be a time of mixed feelings for you after your amazing time with Council, leading some very challenging areas, but always with your warmth and commitment to supporting Aucklanders to live more sustainably. I'm so grateful to have worked with you, particularly over my last three years as Chair of the Environment Committee. Alf and I could not have successfully advocated for the environment to a targeted rate without the huge amount of background research and academically robust creative thinking that you provided us with to support the proposal. Gail, I know your deep personal commitment to bringing nature into all our lives and your tread lightly caravan project is testament to your passion for protecting our fragile environment. Thank you for your inspiration, your friendship and your help over the years and for ensuring that we are always focused on the big picture, supporting our community to find ways to love their environment and live a bit more sustainably. Welcome to life outside of council. Lots of good work still to do. Noho ora mai penny. So kia ora, and I think Alf is, um, wants to make a quick comment too. Uh, yeah, I do. Look, there's a, there's a Psalm 1 proverb that I'm going to read to you. Um, and it's Oleala uh, ilepule ole tautua, which is the road to leadership is through service. Um, Gail, I remember you when Penny and I ended up um, having the Environmental and Community Committee. And I remember how it led us like both Penny and I ended up and um, um, talking to you, to all the staff, around what we, we wanted to do with the environmental space, but just to lift it. And I, I believe over the, the, that term and the last term we did, and, and the sole reason in regards to the environmental space was you. So look, I, I, I want to acknowledge your, your service that's been outlined uh, by Barry, but more importantly, I think it's the friendship that we ended up forming. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate what uh, Penny has said. Um, you are an amazing woman. Uh, you're an amazing leader. 
and, and I thank you for the work uh, that has been done in regards to the environmental space. And in particular, I, I, I think is the first report that we ended up working on um, in, in the last term. So I, I wish you all the best, you and your, your whanau. Um, you know, I, I, I really do. Um, I, I hope you end up finding what you want to do on your, your now new journey, because you're still young. So, so you know, with, with, with that journey, I mean, look, if there's anything you want me to do, whether it be clean your pathways, I'll find somebody to do that for you. Um, but, Your Worship, I just want to say to, to you, thank you so much in regards to um, the both targeted rates. Uh, without your leadership in regards to that, we wouldn't have had what we had in the last three years and what we will get uh, as a result of both uh, councillors Hills and Coombe in regard to this committee. So, ngā mihi ki a koe e te rangatira. Um, I wish you all the best. Kia ora. Thank you, Chair. Kia ora, Alf. Thank you. And just a brief comment from <coughs> Councillor Darby, and then we better... Um Get to lunch. Yeah, I just want to say brief words. Look, I, I can't um, help but think, you know, you know, perseverance fur does further, Gail. Perseverance does further. And you probably know that you started out on the road less travelled and you gathered people on that journey and you built quite a team and it has been, a, from what I understand, a pretty tight team of um, big far now, real far now, uh, that you wrapped around your ideas and yourself, and it became the road most travelled. Uh, and that's where we are now. And you've come from a place where there was not a lot of listening, and that was management and political listening. It was lacking. And you persevered, and you got us to listen. You got Auckland to listen, and we're on that journey. It's the road most travelled, and thank you for taking us on that road. Thank you, Councillor Darby. Just got a brief comment from Member Wilcox. Hoi nei te mihi ki a koe e Gail, noho mai rā i nga ringa ringa rawa o te atua. And that's cool. And, um, yeah, just from me, thank you um, so much for the short time. We've got to work closely together. Um, you know, just your passion, energy, positivity is, is infectious, and I think you know... Um, although you are so humble, I think you know the um, imprint you've left on the council and the community and our environment for all the passion and work you've done um, as a loyal staff member, but also someone who is really out there in the community getting people uh, rounded up. And I know during Level 4 lockdown, you were doing lots of work with the Ministry of, uh, for the Environment and trying to get us uh, shovel-ready environment-related projects and talking directly to our um, community groups who were worried about losing funding and having things cut. And when I was ringing you stressed out about things, you were going straight to those community groups in the middle of what was probably a tough time for yourself as well um, to make sure those community groups felt OK and supported. And I had text messages from community groups saying, I just can't believe that we're you know, getting this information from council officers during this time. So they were really appreciative of that. So I just want to... I'm so sad you're leaving, but um, thank you so much for all the work you've done, and we will continue um, supporting the legacy that you and your team and your leadership has, uh, has helped gain. So um, if you want to... You don't have to reply to any of us, but if you want to say anything, um, yeah. I'd just like to say a couple of things. I know everyone's um, wanting to get to, to lunch, but uh, I, I mainly want to applaud... Um, the people around this table. I think that, um, yeah, there was road not well travelled, but, but the, the leadership on creating the momentum and the awareness around the importance of the natural environment to our well-being and to our future, I think largely came from around here. You know, you, 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 and, and it's still there. You know, I hear Councillor Coombe asking things about you know, land water management. We, we've got a long way to go in land water management. It took us ages as a unitary authority to recognise that we're not just a district council, we've got region-wide responsibility and we're on that, we're, we're heading down that track and it's, it's, it's your, I just feel really grateful to have been in this organisation um, led by your um, insight, Meg, off, you know, to, to, to grab this 
bull by the horns, if you like, and, and make it real and make it relevant to Auckland. And I just feel like I've been contributing along the way. So I, I just, you know, I've always been a huge supporter of Auckland Council. I've loved my time here. I'm, I'm pretty overwhelmed and emotional about moving on. You know, I go from sadness to excitement and it's a it's a complete pendulum but i i just think you guys you you've led the way you've 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 mainstreamed this topic and it's just going to i'm leaving i feel like i'm leaving behind a really um cohesive department um that are set up to support you as you continue to mainstream environment so i just thank you and and i know you're you'll continue down that pathway and, and hopefully our paths will cross. So thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Gail. And we will, I hope you stay for a cup of tea and a, a conversation at a socially distanced um, <laughs> uh, distance from each other. But thank you so much again. And I'm sure we'll see more of you um, hopefully coming to bang your, your fist on the table at public forum when we're when we're needing to do things. So thank you so much. And to all councillors and staff, we will finally get to uh, a lunch break. We'll come back at quarter past two and try and get through the last part of the, um, the committee really quickly so we can get on to um, ALF's committee as well. So thank you so much. See you in half an hour. Just under.